And we'll start today's lecture, which carries on from uh, accuracy and repeatability from last lecture in measurement. And we're going to talk a little bit today about traceable, about traceability. Let's try this again before we have a seizure. Try that one more time. Come on, baby. All right. Uh, I think I want a whole full slideshow. You guys are seeing my uh, little things on the side there, hey? Oh, uh, view. Hello, view. Oh, my view, normal view, slideshow from beginning. There we go. I'm not sure what screen you're getting there. Full, full screen says traceability. Is that what you guys have? Yes. Okay, perfect. So traceability, uh, this is a pretty short lecture. There's uh, not a lot of uh, beefy stuff in here. No, no real math or anything that we have to worry about. Uh, this module basically describes uh, how it is that we can trust the process measurement value as being correct um, through traceability back to different international and national standards. Um, so it'll describe the different types of standards uh, different governing bodies that are involved in, in the certification of the standards that we use for calibrations and things like that, uh, and the different types of uh, regulations and things that are in place uh, that mandate the accuracy uh, of measurement that we are uh, responsible for. So uh, nice background stuff. Again, not, not too heavy. I don't think there's any math in it whatsoever. So traceability. Boom. Here we go. Okay, so... Uh, you can determine the uncertainty of process variables only if the instrument you use to measure it has been calibrated to a recognized standard. And we, we know this. This is why we have to send our uh, our equipment away to get it calibrated. Um, it goes to, you know, a BHD or whatever company it is that you use, and, and they calibrate it for you, and they provide you a, a document, and they give you your instrument back with a little sticker on it, usually. Um, the same thing happens for them. The gear that they use uh, to calibrate your gear has to be calibrated also against against some other higher standard. Uh, so this this chain of standards that we talk about, uh, starting from you know the truck level, the, the fluke meter or whatever uh, standard you have in your truck, all the way up to some type of international standard. So we know that globally, everybody is comparing apples uh, to apples and oranges to oranges. Okay, so instrumentation technicians are uh, required to calibrate or maintain measurement instruments, and we need to know how to how to accomplish this. Okay, we're going to uh, three little objectives here: describe traceability and its importance in measurement and related certification. So I think really we've already talked about its important in, importance in measurement. You know, the the quality of of the machine that I'm using is is dependent on the quality of every machine uh, above it. And there's a certain amount of uh, certification and paperwork that goes along with it. So we're going to look at that in terms of traceability. Second objective is describing the regulatory standards and governing bodies uh, that are responsible for measurement, measurement accuracy and traceability. So we'll talk primarily about uh, Measurement Canada, uh, but we'll also look how it ties into uh, international bodies uh, as well. And then the third uh, objective is describing how measurement traceability relates to regulatory standards. So nothing to, to what the heck is going on there? That's interesting. All right, so what is traceability? Let's define that right off the bat. Uh, metrological traceability, and metrological is, uh, I guess it's a European style word for instrumentation or, or measurement. Uh, but measurement traceability for our purposes is the property of the result of a measurement whereby it can be related to stated references through an unbroken chain of comparisons, all having stated uncertainty. So basically it's just saying that traceability is, is a, a result of calibration and calibration documentation that tells us how accurate it is, what it's accurate to, all the way from you, all the way up to some big governing body. So usually these standards are national, or international conformance organizations. And really what we're trying to decide is, are the units I'm selling in the same as the buyer is using? 
and can I prove that my equipment is accurate? So this is the purpose. Uh, so that we have you know standards globally. <clears throat> Governing bodies, uh, Measurement Canada uh, and the National Research Council of Canada are mandated to ensure the integrity and accuracy of trade measurement in Canada. So they uh, oversee the legal uh, end of it. Uh, they abide by global standards, standards that are set out by one or more different organizations, and there's several of them out there, and uh, they may uh, uh, abide by all of them or, or some of them, but this is a list out of the ILM. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology, you may or may not have heard uh, of that before. ISO, I think most of us are probably familiar with the uh, International Organization for Standardization, uh, and INMS. So, uh, all of these organizations, again, are global organizations and countries around the world uh, try to fit into some of these standards, again, so that we have apples compared to apples and oranges to oranges and fair, uh, fair trade glo globally. Okay, so here's some different types of, of standards here, starting, uh, starting from like the shop where you have a dead weight tester with different uh, representative weights in it. They are compared uh, to some other type of a standard. That standard is compared to a, another standard and then at the very top of the pyramid, there's a, what we call the international prototype kilogram that is the main standard. And you can see here in the fancy little glass uh, laboratory tray here, it's a very uh, scientific piece of uh, equipment. There's a certain number of these, for example, every country would have probably one of these and then they'd make themselves you know, a few of these and then you can make yourself a few of these and then everybody's kind of got one of these. So there's different levels of standards, but they are all, uh, let's say, children uh, of, of, a, of a parent uh, standard somewhere. So an international standard that is recognized globally, then a national standard, then maybe an Alberta standard, and then maybe a Red Deer standard, and then the stuff that you have uh, in your shop. So with every step along the way here, it has to be traceable. We have to know what it's been compared to so that we can, we can know that what we're holding is accurate to this, this is accurate to this, this is accurate to this. So it comes with paperwork uh, and we call that a traceability chain. And it's an unbroken chain from the top down to you, uh, meaning that it's traceable all the way from MR1 to number 50 to IPK, ultimately to the devices that we end up using to do uh, the services that we do. Okay, different standards uh, that we deal with in instrumentation, uh, international standards that take care of things like the, that international prototype kilogram, national standards, primary standards. So these are the, the bigger ones that we probably never really see. Then we get into the ones that we kind of deal with on a more regular basis. So secondary standards, uh, working standards, covers our test gear, uh, reference standards that test our test gear, uh, and then there's some intrinsic standards which have some type of a, a physical property that uh, doesn't change that we can uh, reference to things like the triple point of water or the temperature of uh, ice water, that type of thing. <clears throat> okay, um, I said again, there's documentation that goes along with this. The accuracy of the measurement depends upon this traceability to a primary standard in accordance with the Mates and Weights and Measures Act uh, that is of course looked after by uh, Measurement Canada. So again, every time one of these uh, standards gets calibrated or generated or created, it comes with a piece of paper uh, that says this is a kilogram uh, plus or minus 0 0.000000001 of the gram. Uh, this guy gets uh, same type of piece of paper that's saying maybe it's not quite as accurate, but it should be pretty darn close. The idea, of course, is that all of these are exactly the same, but if they're not, we have that paperwork that tells us to which degree of accuracy we should uh, expect in the, in the standard that we're dealing with. Okay, the comparison, and this is important, these next three points here, uh, should be made by accredited laboratories. And again, Measurement Canada will tell you who is accredited, who is not accredited. Uh, if you've got lots of time in your life and you want to check it out, go on Measurement Canada's website and you can look up some of this stuff and it's just tons and tons of legislation. Uh, so made by accredited laboratories, made with validated methods, so proper procedures, and include again that estimation of measurement uncertainty or that plus or minus value um, 
that we are holding it to. Okay, primary standard uh, is a standard that is widely acknowledged as having the highest metrological qualities and whose value is accepted without reference to other standards of the same quantity. So whether it's a temperature standard, a pressure standard, uh, a, a weight or mass standard, or a time standard for that matter, the primary standard is the standard. It's the, it's uh, what do you call it, the gold medal thing, or it's the top of the pyramid at any rate. An example of a primary standard used for time and frequency is this MISTF1 standard, and it's a fancy dancy uh, cesium clock or an atomic clock that is residing in, in Colorado somewhere, and there's a little a little image of this uh, fancy clock. So that's the that's the be all end all standard for time. You know, so time is not something that we generally think about. We can't calibrate for time, uh, but many of the things that we measure are uh, relative to time. So it has a standard, as do uh, most of the other measurements. Shop standards are things that we're most familiar with. Uh, when we're at work, we use the equipment to calibrate and verify the accuracy of measurement instruments. To do this, we use our shop standards. We have shop standards for all the different types of processes, temperature, pressure, uh, electronics like voltage, uh, milliamps, those things, uh, analyzers involving gases and things like that. So there's a section here in the ILM, pages 12 to 15, where we talk about the, the different type of shop standards. So there's a few pages on pressure and a few pages on temperature and, and those type of things. And they tell us, uh, you know, what, what of these standards that we commonly use are, are considered to be primary standards or, or secondary standards. Uh, and you see here in yellow, these are uh, focus of your attention. Uh, again, to be able to, to discern um, what, is a, what is a primary standard versus a secondary standard. And, and really when it comes, I don't know if there's an easy way to say it or not an easy way to say it, but if it has to be calibrated regularly, it's probably a secondary standard. Uh, if it only has to be calibrated uh, occasionally or, or never, it's closer to the top and more likely uh, a primary standard. It's probably more definitive ways to state that, but uh, I think that's a fairly good general guideline. Temperature standards, uh, some of the ones that we, we are familiar with here, dry block, calibrators, uh, fancy reference uh, thermometers, uh, RTD or thermocouple uh, additions to our electronic uh, meters. Uh, a couple of ones here that are, uh, what was the word for this again? I, I've forgotten already. Intrinsic standards, uh, the triple point of water, the ice point of of water are examples of intrinsic standards. Uh, they're, they're relative to some type of scientific or physical property associated uh, with them. Uh, like we know ice melts at uh, zero degrees and water freezes at zero degrees. So if we have uh, a well-stirred container of ice water, we're pretty darn sure it's right around zero, at least close enough for us to uh, deal with. Uh, these temperature devices are referenced to the International Temperature Scale, ITS-90, again, not too uh, fantastic for things that you have to remember here. It's not too complicated. Okay, so triple point of water is one of these intrinsic standards here, and we'll call that an intrinsic primary standard. Uh, again, this means that it's a pretty high standard. It's uh, not many things are going to change the triple point of water. Um, this standard defines 0 0.01 degrees Celsius in this ITS uh, scale. And it is, by definition, the point where liquid water, ice, and vapor exist at equilibrium. And we use that to identify thermometer drift between calibrations, uh, provide a primary calibration point, and also use that for verification checks between calibrations. And we do, you guys have done labs like this. I believe uh, second year you do a, a, a dumb temperature transmitter calibration using the ice bath. Uh, and, and this is basically what you're doing is you're trying to make this primary standard, your intrinsic standard by, by stirring ice into water. So uh, same kind of idea. Okay, ice point of water, again, uh, similar, but this is technically between uh, the ice and the air saturated water at a state of pressure. Uh, again, so close to zero, uh, but this one is not traceable to ITS 90. And don't ask me, don't ask me why this one, which is uh, stated at, at 
0, 0.0. Uh, and the one that's actually the primary reference is 0 0.01. I can't really, I can't really answer that question for you, but I'm assuming that because it involves all three states uh, and they can quantify it, I guess maybe that's why it's the standard uh, related to this ITS, but I don't know that for a fact, but do know that uh, this here ITS uh, 90 defines this intrinsic standard for triple point and it's 0 0.01 as you can and again, by the color of the letter in here, we know what we're interested in. Okay, electronic standards, these are the standards uh, that apply to the meters that we use every day. Uh, we generally have to have them certified every two years to verify that all the work that we're doing with them is accurate and traceable. Um, handheld meters uh, are generally secondary standards, and we can kind of get that idea from the fact that we've got to send them away uh, every once in a while to have them calibrated. So this includes all the signal types. Uh, that the meters can do, milliamps, volts, millivolts, KPAs, uh, whatever it happens to be, Celsius, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the handheld, uh, bench and reference meters, uh, all electronic type of meters, uh, but generally considered to be more accurate the closer you get from your truck uh, to a laboratory. So your, your fluke meter that you have in your tool bag is probably the least accurate of the bunch. Uh, a bench version would be a little bit more accurate and then of course one that was in uh, a laboratory or maybe a PhD or I don't even I don't know the name of any other companies that do calibrations but ones that they have would be slightly more uh, more accurate. Uh, the irony here uh, of course and you've probably had this conversation before is that most smart transmitters out there uh, nowadays are actually more accurate than the fluke meters that we use um, but everyone kind of ignores that. <clears throat> Okay, analytical standards, so analytical meaning probably analyzers uh, used for liquid and gas mixtures that we use to calibrate devices or bump gases uh, and things, things like, like, like that. Uh, there are varying degrees of accuracy and quality among these reference standards. Uh, we talked, did we talk about cali calibration gases and bottles and stuff? Was that last lecture? Um, if it was last lecture, you, you've heard about it already, the different quality standards between uh, gases you know uh and and so we've covered that if not we're going to be covering it soon uh and you'll see that uh the calibration gases that we buy come at different quality levels uh as well uh so the most accurate ones are traceable uh to si through the national metrological institute and all that kind of good stuff so uh traceability is the topic here and again regardless of what standard we're using it's got to come with documentation that we can follow uh, all the way up the chain. Okay, regulatory standards. I believe this is uh, the last objective already here, about page 27 in the ILM here. Um, standards can be legislated or voluntary. Um, generally, we deal with legislated standards, you know, when we're dealing with analyzers and, and uh, trade measurements. Voluntary standards are basically process measurements that we use for operations as a general rule. Um, if it's a legislative standard, of course, the rules must be followed. Uh, if it's voluntary, of course, it's your choice. <clears throat> Measurement Canada uh, has the sole responsibility for all trade measurements made in Canada. They use the Weights and Measures Act and the Electricity and Gas Inspection Act uh, as, the, as the written uh, legislation to uh, govern all of, of the standards and procedures and things that we have to do. Under Underneath uh, the Weights and Measures Act, there's, there's other things that are in there. Uh, specific to us this year is the Alberta Energy Regulator, uh, which sets rules in Alberta for oil and gas. And we'll talk a little bit now about the Alberta Energy Regulator, uh, formerly known as the ERCB, and something called Directive 17. Uh, and don't think that you're gonna do uh, two pages on Directive 17 and then you'll be done. Uh, you won't have to worry about it again because it does come up again uh, in fourth year. So the more you remember from third year, the less stuff you gotta remember in fourth year. Okay, so let's look, Weights, Weights and Measures Act, what kind of things uh, do they cover aside from everything? Uh, they, excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, the Act governs the purchase and sale of measured products and services. 
Uh, the regulations will specify the uncertainty a device must meet. We said that earlier, it's part of the traceability chain. Uh, the installation of devices, so how we install things, the operation of devices, and the cost of approval and certification. So um, believe it or not, the government actually tells uh, companies how much they can charge you uh, for calibration and calibration certificates and things like that. Okay, that's Weights and Measures Act. Uh, we deal with measurements that are governed under that act as well as measurements that are covered under the Electricity and Gas Inspection Act, of course, being a gas and oil producer. Uh, this act governs the purchase and sale of gas and electricity. Um, its stipulations are similar uh, to the Weights and Measures Act, but of course, more specific uh, to gas and electricity. <clears throat> When an inspector tests and approves a measuring device, uh, it receives a sticker. Uh, we've seen this sticker probably uh, out and about. We'll see these on gas pumps or grocery store scales. If you ever see a, a scale in a grocery store anymore, but once upon a time, they used to have scales all over the place in grocery stores. Uh, but a sticker, something like this, they used to be kind of round, um, but the most easy place to, to spot one of these things is on a gas pump. And basically it tells you, uh, you know, when it's been calibrated, who calibrated it, when you're going to do it again, all that kind of wonderful stuff. So, if it's been uh, if it's been you know, looked at under the guise of Measurement Canada, it'll generally get a sticker. Okay, reference materials. Uh, what comes along with that sticker? A certificate is to be provided to device owners and a seal affixed to the device upon passing initial inspection, showing the date of the inspection. Uh, you know, you know the seal. Uh, removing the seal valid, invalidates your warranty uh, or invalidates the calibration. Um, you see them on the back of uh, your process meters, your 789s, even, even your electrical meters. I think if you send them away to get calibrated, we'll come back with a sticker and a certificate. Um, should you have to do this periodically, of course, the inspection expiry date is usually shown on the certificate and that lets us know how often uh, we have to send it in for. Um, Recertification. Okay, non-regulated, or sorry, regulated non-trade measurements. So, uh, trade measurements, you know, include uh, the sale of oil and gas, for example, or uh, sale type items. Um, that would be trade. Uh, non-trade measurements include things like environmental measurements uh, for emissions and pollution and that kind of things. Uh, measurements that are associated with uh, reporting volumes and things like that. So if you're in a, a you work a gas field or an oil field and you have uh, several different uh, you know pump stations and all those pump stations are connected to a header and the header goes to a, a battery uh, or you truck all the pump stations into a, a battery and uh, you got to have measurements at the wellhead. You got to have measurements coming into the battery. You got to have measurements coming out of the battery. You got to report how much water was in your sample, how much uh, gas was in your sample, how much oil was in your sample. Uh, all, of, all of these different things uh, that relate to royalties basically because it's a natural resource. Uh, it belongs to all the citizens of whatever land you're in. Uh, and we get tax money uh, from that in Alberta. Uh, you know, we ride that roller coaster uh, where oil is good, like now, 100 bucks a barrel, and we rake in buckets and buckets of cash, and then oil crashes down to the $2 a barrel, and then we're broke and we're poor again. So these measurements are, are how we get that money. Um, other examples of non trade measurements here include Alberta's Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act, uh, that covers emissions. Uh, MSM's code. Uh, I don't know uh, if any of you in the field out there deal with uh, SEMS at all, um, but SEMS is that uh, continuous emission monitoring systems, basically stack analyzers uh, for uh, emissions and pollution. Okay, other voluntary standards. Now, some sites have their own standards. Uh, they generally are there when there's no other uh, government standard or regulation that they need to meet. Some of them are just there to ensure product consistency or quality. Uh, some companies will choose to comply with a with a standard like ISO 9001, uh, just you know to to show people that they care and maybe give them a competitive edge. So that's a, a voluntary standard. Uh, the 
AER, uh, or formerly known as the ERCB, the Alberta Energy uh, Resources and Conservation Board here, uh, now called the Alberta Energy Regulator. Uh, the, the mission of the Alberta Energy Regulator is to ensure that the discovery, development, and delivery of Alberta's energy resources and utilities take place in a fair and responsible manner in the public's interest. So that's uh, the government looking out for us. So that's the AER. And again, this will this will come back uh, to haunt us next year. Okay, standard and base conditions for use in calculating uh, and reporting oil, water, and gas volumes are meters cubed, 101.325 uh, absolute, and 15 degrees Celsius. So again, you're in orange. Those of you who work in the field, you might even know that off the top of your head. Uh, but if you don't, uh, you probably should if you're an oil and gas guy, uh, because we do. that's kind of our industry. All right, Directive 17. This is Alberta Energy Regulator again. Directive 17 again deals specifically with uh, oil and gas measurements, uh, and it tells us all kinds of things. If you have, uh, again, can't fall asleep at night, get on the old interweb and look up Directive 17, and it'll definitely put you to sleep. Uh, some of the requirements. Uh, outlined under Directive 17 tells us that we uh, have to calibrate portable provers every two years, stationary provers every four years, uh, your calibration instruments every two years, master meters every three months, uh, and again, like uh, Measurement Canada said, our, our calibrating device must be more accurate than what you're than what you're calibrating. So, uh, Directive 17, of course, contains way, way, way more information in there, but that's a taste uh, of what you can look for. Uh, in Directive 17, should you ever uh, feel suicidal and uh, want to put an end to everything. Okay, in conclusion, back to traceability is a documented, unbroken chain of calibration standards traced back to a national or international standard, which must, must, must have these essential elements. An unbroken chain of comparison, so from the bottom of the pyramid, all the way to the top, measurement uncertainty being calculated, and each step is documented. So it's not traceable if any of these components are missing. So that's how you know the stuff that you're doing is good work. And that is the end. Any questions? Sorry, can you back up to that last conclusion slide? I just want to take a couple notes. Oh, God, I don't know if I can. <laughs> you oh. shut her down. Thanks. Is it, in, is it in the content? It, hang on. I, I still got it up here. I can, I, can, I can wrangle this, I think. It is in content. All the, power, all the PowerPoints are in course content. Uh, again, all the video lectures are also in uh, Blackboard Collaborate. So you can watch them again uh, anytime you need to fall asleep.